Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartoszak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today my guest is Heiko Borshevt, uh, one of the most prominent strategic thinkers, in my personal opinion, in Europe, uh, with a vast uh, background and with a vast experience of 25 years of uh, consulting, uh, policy consulting, uh, strategy consulting, uh, advising the, both the business, uh, military environment, uh, communities and the governments. Uh, hello, Heiko. How are you? Yes, sir. Good morning. Doing fine. Many thanks for having me. It's great being online with you. Okay. For Strategy and Future uh, subs subscribers and for people that follow what we do, it would, would not be surprised that I will start the conversation by saying that uh, we closely monitor what Heiko publishes and what he does and what he says. Um, as we think that uh, uh, my guest today is always uh, or very often a step ahead of the conventional thinking uh, in, in, the, you know, in the way that we at Strategy in Future really like. And so uh, Heiko, pardon me for you know, opening our conversation in, in this uh, format, but this is what I wanted to say. Also to draw attention uh, to our, of our listeners to uh, what you will be uh, talking about, so to speak. And let's get started with uh, topic number one, uh, military innovation. Uh, you penned the report, recent, uh, recently the report uh, titled, Beware the Hype, What Military Conflicts in Ukraine, Syria, Libya, and so forth. Don't or tell us about the future of war. Uh, you know, and the, the, the most interesting part for, my, uh, for myself, given the fact that we are trying to do the military innovation mm -hmm. project in Poland as strategy in future, is the military innovation, the obstacles, the, uh, yeah. the frictions and flows that such innovative thinking has. Uh, would you elaborate more on that, both in terms of the uh, idea itself and uh, how it works? His, you know, just please. please absolutely, it. absolutely, with pleasure, Jacek. And you, you almost made me blush. I don't know whether this, whether the audience is going to see that, but with all these compliments, this is. Is of course that that's that's a fantastic start. Yeah, military innovation. I think it's a it's a perfect subject um, to to talk our to start our discussion in particular against the background what you said with regard to um, um, the discussion about the new a new model army um, in, in Poland. What is going on right now in terms of um, transatlantic defense industrial cooperation? Um, all the programs going on in Europe with the European Commission just launching the European Defense Fund. I think. Everybody talks about military innovation, but sometimes I, I, I ask myself, uh, if, if military innovation is the problem or the solution, what really is the problem that we need to solve? And for, for most people, I think, and for most, for most analysts, military innovation has a very strong um, technological connotation. So whenever we talk about new technology, when we talk about the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned systems in other military domains, when we talk about the use of artificial intelligence, everybody thinks that this alone constitutes innovation. But as we were trying to, to argue in, in our paper, we were at a hype, technology alone does not constitute innovation. Interestingly, it's the same in the business world. But technology alone doesn't allow your company to leapfrog over competitors. You always need to embed technology in a convincing business model. That's the corporate way of thinking. And the, the, the analog to a business model in the corporate world, of course, is strategy and concepts and culture in the defense environment. So I think that the, the most important part when talking about when talking about defense innovation is how we how we build bridges between um, the technology community, the operational um, community, and the concept and strategy developers. Because every the use of every technology needs to resonate against the background of your overall strategic culture. It needs to fit your past operational experience. And of course, it also needs to fit into your um, strategic, national strategic ambitions. No? So sometimes I, I think that, that nations um, and force planners jump on certain 
tech-driven developments for the pure sake of um, either evoking the impression of being um, modern or of trying to build bridges with strategic partners. So you choose a certain technology because you believe that by choosing a technology or choosing a certain defense product, um, you might remain interoperable with your strategic partner. But, but we always tend to forget that, and there's a very nice book by, by Dima Adamski on military innovation making this point, weapons are ultimately social constructs. No? So whenever, whenever we engage also in, in defense cooperation with partners, everybody brings with, with, with him or with her a kind of doctrinal past, a kind of operational experience that is all embedded in these defense systems. And by simply making a choice to go with partner A and partner B, all these implicit assumptions um, are then all of a sudden part of this partnership, but we never really properly reflect upon it. No, So that's why our argument was, and this might perhaps also build, build into our discussion, um, the fact that these days you may be able to achieve certain military effects with the use of unmanned systems, this alone doesn't constitute a game-changing military innovation. Or the real question is how you are going to use these systems. And so UAVs are just most, most likely the most, the most hyped and the most talked about um, military asset these days. But from everything we have seen in these four conflicts that we were looking at, none of the use cases was deviating from existing concepts of operations. So in a way, we were just substituting all the conflict parties. We're just substituting ways of delivering military effects so far delivered via manned assets. And this has been replaced and substituted with unmanned assets. So nothing really new. And I think this is, this is the really tricky part about the discussion of military innovation to separate hype from proper new ways of thinking or really delivering military effects. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Uh, I always use this argument about Napoleon times when actually Napoleon didn't have any new weaponry. He just uh, knew how to use it in a completely new fashion, uh, completely new fashion, uh, creating a completely shock effect on the battlefield for some time at least, uh, as long as his opponents uh, didn't learn how to uh, counter it. Uh, so I fully, I fully agree. And let, let me complicate the issue, Heiko, a little mm -hmm. bit, you know? Just let's dive deeper. Uh, take a look at Europe and also Poland uh, you know, as a country in Europe. Given the, the currently changing geopolitical uh, environment, also combined, with a revolution military affairs that, of course, mm -hmm. is debatable. How far mm -hmm. it went, mm -hmm. where, and so on, okay? What sort mm -hmm. of battlefield mm -hmm. we talk about? And uh, imagine Europe. What Europe should do in military innovation to really answering, because, because it all comes to the theory of war, okay? So what sort yep. of war you want to fight? What sort of instrument you need to, you need to have to, to, to make it happen? And, and that concerns Poland, uh, uh, Europe uh, squeezed between Russia and United States actually facing challenges, rise of China and mil revolution military affairs. So that's, that's a very general question. I promise to, to dive even deeper, but let me start with this one. So where would we go from, from here? I think that the trickiest part, the trickiest part probably is, um, and this is something that lies, of, lies at the heart of the, of the innovation discussion, no? How are we going to structure the new defense ecosystems? And this has at least two different dimensions. Of course, the first question is, when you look at ecosystems and technology, 
what really is today's understanding of defense? Uh, is it still the, 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 the steel bending um, past experience or are we, are we gradually moving into new technology areas where, for example, all of a sudden healthcare and, and biotechnology become key elements of a future national defense posture in particular against the background of the of the COVID-19 pandemic, and thus should be considered key ingredients of your national defense technological industrial base. Um, and on the other hand, there is this, this thin line that we that we need to walk um, in Europe, and that constitutes the question of, or that, or that refers to the question of force development and the long-term strategic ideas that guide force development. And when you look at both perspectives in tandem, it becomes, of course, more than obvious that there is no, and, and that's, that's of course not, 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 not really news, but there is no generic European approach to, defense, to these issues. Um, you most likely have at least three, if not four different clubs inside the European Union that all share different strategic perspectives. Now, there might be, let's say, there might be the Scandinavian club with a traditional North American um, bias. There might be members of, of, the, of the core team Europe along the Franco-German alliance. The southern part in Europe, again, has its own, uh, of course, strategic challenges emanating from, from the Mediterranean. And Italy, in particular, has a very strong defense industrial connection vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis the United States. So, so the tricky part is how you break free, on the one hand, um, from your long-term strategic perceptions that, of course, are being shaped by many different factors, not least your geostrategic location. And on the other hand, um, if and to what extent you are willing and able to break up also your long-term defense industrial partnerships. So there is always a default mode. No? There is a default mode among certain European nations to say, well, listen, in the end, we buy American and we go American. That's why um, there was, as you know, there was strong, um, strong opposition against um, excluding the U.S. from either PESCO, the Permanent Structured Corporation, um, and the European Defense Fund. So now there is an option, of course, as we know, with, with the third party rule. But this, of course, has been driven in the end um, by, by very strong defense industrial interests. And of course, then the other default position is yeah, we go, we go European and going European most often means, most often means you either involve the French, um, Spain, Italy, Germany, or to a lesser extent, the UK, and you try to build around your, your defense ecosystem um, around these four or five nations. But and this is interesting then now from a, from a Polish perspective or from a Central and Eastern European perspective. I mean, there, there's a lot of potential in Central and Eastern European countries in terms of defense industrial potential. Now, because interestingly, um, some of the nations in the region, they don't, they're not bound by the same industrial path dependence that is limiting the strategic leeway for Western European countries. No? If you have been investing over decades into maintaining well-established defense primes, it's very hard to break loose and break away from these defense primes. Um, but some of the smaller nations in, in Europe, not only in, in Central and Eastern Europe, but also smaller countries in the West, if you look at, if you look, for example, at the Netherlands, if you look at Portugal, who Portugal has a very interesting um, 
a very interesting uh, expertise when it comes to unmanned systems, in particular in the maritime domain. Uh, Belgium is a very interesting partner when it comes to um, startups in the fields of unmanned systems, artificial intelligence, uh, cybersecurity. Luxembourg, Luxembourg is a hidden space champion. Um, Slovenia, on the other side of, of the European continent, Slovenia, for example, is very good at, at modeling and simulation and simulation-based training. So there, there's a lot of expertise in Europe that, that needs to be organized in a new way. But this is easier said than done, how you organize these partners and their expertise in a, in a new way, because in one way or another, um, you always bump into um, the two elements we were discussing before, the, the defense industrial path dependence and your, and your path dependence that, that is related to the way um, you, you think about strategic, strategic challenges. You know, let, let, let me just uh, focus for a while, particularly on Poland, my country. Uh, so, uh, and of course, I would like to sort of uh, ask you for your opinion or sort of uh, uh, your uh, uh, way of thinking and how to approach it. So, Poland, now facing the new generation warfare, because this is actually from Russia. So, this is the, the challenge, this is the threat in the region. Part of EU, part of NATO, heavily dependent upon US in terms of security. Uh, old vested interests, both from the old industrial era of the communist times with heavy factories and stuff, legacy force, also uh, right now heavily dependent upon US and the supplies from the US, which create, uh, which creates of course a vested interest as well. Uh, at the same time facing the completely new warfare in a different way. Uh, under Article 5, gray zones, a lot of uh, things that are non-kinetic, uh, that calls more for the state immunity, so to speak, mm -hmm. immunity, mm -hmm. or resistance, state resistance, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, and also combined by the revolution military affairs, you know, agility, speed, yeah. space reconnaissance, yeah. uh, deep rates, and, you know, reconnaissance strike systems of the Russian model. And completely, in my personal opinion, we are unprepared for that. And we, we have the strategy of hope. And hope is not a good strategy, as we know, because yeah. we hope that NATO would, yeah. would be with us, and especially U.S. But, you know, because we need to prepare for the world, for the, you know, not even the worst, I think the more probable even more scenarios. Mm -hmm. We need to think about the future of EU, whether it will survive the future of US. It's, you know, it's maybe withdrawal to the world ocean to balance the system, balance Eurasia, uh, not, not to mention pivoting to, 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 to uh, Asia Pacific, Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. Pardon me for this lengthy introduction of the question mm -hmm. that I want to have, but mm -hmm. you know, and we have a GDP that is that really can feel the the force, you know. Uh, we, yeah. Our GDP is bigger than Israel. Uh, our GDP is it's not not that much less than Turkey's. Turks feel the yeah. force that uh, takes on Russians, right, in different places. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to Europe. We don't know what's going to happen to US, and we need to and mm. we will stay put here, okay, between mm. the other and the bigger. So we are, I think, at the cusp, and, and, and of course, actually, this is mm -hmm. the only land, mm -hmm. land and mm -hmm. land warfare environment in in the world right now between peer competitors, maybe with the exception of the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. so how to navigate the debate, mm -hmm. uh, given all those huge forces that are squeezing us into thinking like that, thinking like this, thinking there, okay? How to how to how to do it? Given the fact, uh, Heiko, that we used to have a, a great strategic thinking, great strategic culture. So it's not that we are building from nothing, you know, like many mm -hmm. nations. We don't mm -hmm. need to imitate. We don't mm -hmm. need to adapt. We might mm -hmm. field our mm -hmm. own indigenous way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a fascinating, an absolutely fascinating topic that that you're that you're opening up now. Um, and I was just. Towards the end, though, when you were referring to um, land-based conflict and strategic culture, 
I, I was just asking myself the question, well, of course, everybody would most likely expect Poland to focus, if we go back on military innovation, no, to focus on military innovation in the land domain. But the question is, is this really the right strategic way of looking into the long-term interests of a country like Poland. It, most likely it would, it would be relatively easy because it's accepted, it's close to your tradition, um, it ties into your logical um, geographic location, so fine with that. The question is, would a defense posture that reinforces the land footprint really be a defense posture that you could also leverage for broader economic growth and, and tech-related innovation? So, um, I mean, I put it as a question mark. I, I really don't know, but I could imagine, I could imagine, no, looking, looking at um, also discussion we had in, in the past about flow control, so the idea that you really um, consider strategic flows, the exchange of goods, commodities, um, information, capital, and the free movement of people, that you consider this a strategic currency. Other question then is if you start moving away from land focus as a um, static concept and you go into the flows, no? one, one way of looking into these concepts would be military mobility, which is obviously now as a PESCO uh, driven project led by, by the Dutch, but there are very different angles to military mobility. Not two, two years ago, I, I, was, I was publishing a paper with uh, Christian, a good colleague and friend of mine, where we said, it's not only the hardware that needs to travel in Europe, data needs to travel too. But we don't have a digital mobility, quote unquote, defense framework in Europe. So if you'd say um, Poland considers itself a strategic hub, this hub could either be interpreted very traditionally, the flows and the pipes and the roads and the railway tracks, or you say, no, no, listen, guys, our approach to mobility primarily builds on digital mobility. But on digital, with regard to digital mobility, we do not only talk about digital infrastructure, we also talk about the need to share defense data quickly and freely among allies and partners. So this could perhaps, this could be one way of also tapping into um, the ICT footprint and the ICT um, ecosystem that Poland has. And Poland has become, as we know, Poland has become attractive for all sorts of ICT um, startups from, from other European nations. So tapping into um, this digital potential could be one way. But I think what, what, what I would also try to do is, um, I mean, it's always very tempting to start something new in the defense environment as a greenfield project. Or you say, okay, let's start, let's set up a new digital force just outside the established structure. The good thing is, yes, you can do that. The risky thing is you will end up with two completely different mindsets and structures. So what, what I would try to do, I think, is on the one hand, I would try to create islands of innovation or islands of excellence. The old test lab idea. Now, when you go back to the discussion about um, network-enabled capabilities and network-centric warfare throughout the 1990s and the early 2000s, um, most countries at that time were jumping on the idea of we need to have a test lab. 
oh, we need to have a standing military, we need to have standing military units that we can use to rapidly um, insert new technologies, trying to deal with these new technologies in terms of what works, what doesn't work, refine concepts, and then engage in, and this was the buzzword at the time, engage in um, um, rapid, rapid also prototyping to develop technology and concepts in, in tandem. The challenge is how to bridge the gap into the old quote unquote armed forces because they need to be transformed. So the islands of excellence are relatively easy to set up, but you need to move this big tanker no, into a, a new direction. And the question is, how are you going, how are you going to do that? If you, if you look at different nations, many of them use their special forces as concepts and technology spearheads because special forces more or less are standalone quote unquote forces. They, they live a life of their own and they, they are being sent into the most demanding tasks. So there you can create force packages, insert the latest technology, try to verify what works and, and what needs to be adapted. But again, they, they need a lifeline back into the overall system. So I think what would be a very interesting way of trying to bring military into innovation into the established um, structure of Poland's armed forces is two ways. Either you try to set up these test labs for each service, Army, Navy, Air Force, plus whatever joint elements there are. Um, again, comes with pros and cons. On the pro side, service culture would most likely be very open, I assume, to accept these new elements because the Army decides about the Army Innovation Lab, the Navy about its lab, and the Air Force about its lab. But the risk is that you still remain in your well-established stovepipe. So you don't really challenge them to perhaps uh, come up with new, new concepts and new um, operating ideas. So the alternative to service-specific innovation labs would be joint innovation labs, where you, from the beginning, and this is an idea that now is, is um, spilling over, of course, again, from the US into Europe with the, the multi-domain operations concept, which, which originated with the US Army and is now being, if you want so, exported to Europe with, with the first multi-domain uh, units of the US Army being stationed in, uh, in Europe. So this, by the way, um, given the strong transatlantic bonds, of course, between Poland and, and the US, this could be one way of uh, trying to think how you piggyback on the idea of multi-domain operations. You try to set up a kind of multi-domain operations test lab in Poland, where you work on concepts development and technology development and become a kind of, a kind of hub for, for this way of thinking. No? And as you know, NATO just recently um, um, adopted its um, technology accelerator concept is about to set up its own defense innovation fund. Um, the same exists as we know, of course, um, at the European level with the European defense fund. So what, what I think could be a really smart way from a Polish perspective is that you, that you bring these four strands together. So you have a national demand for new ways of um, military thinking and delivering defense capabilities. Strand number one. Um, strand number two, um, if you believe from a strategic perspective that this concept of multi-domain operations makes sense, 
And this is um, a concept which you could use uh, to define a unique selling proposition from a Polish perspective. Uh, this could constitute the second, the second strand. And then you have NATO and the European Union now both offering dedicated programs and sometimes even funds no, to further develop defense capabilities and your um, defense industrial base. So, and these four, strand, four strands together could create the nucleus for um, a kind of innovation lab in Poland. And I think what, what would set this approach apart from other existing initiatives is that you would try to combine and tap into the NATO tech accelerator logic and the European Defense Fund logic. This is tricky, no? This, this will be tricky in how you set things up and how you organize such an entity, but it would be extremely interesting from the perspective of both organizations because they, they both struggle how to synchronize activities. No? And looking also at Poland's past, um, relationship with the European Union, I think it would be an extremely interesting signal from your country towards the European Union and NATO by saying, listen, um, we both know, we all know that our, that our funds are limited. We only have single sets of forces. So let's really combine and build up um, an entity that helps us um, tapping into what NATO does and what the European Commission does with regard to the European Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question about uh, Poland and this and I um, and this sort of subject that we have touched now, and I promise to, to, to move to, to Europe as a sort of a geopolitical unit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th so the question will be like that. You know, in the, in the workshops that we have had uh, at Strategy in the Future for the last, you know, year, year, full year, actually, we have discovered that, of course, we know what the grand strategy objectives of Poland are, uh, because we start with them, you know, we, 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 we lay out what uh, needs to be achieved, who might be the enemy, you know, and so on. But given the rapidity of the flows of information, given the mm -hmm. fact that, uh, as in line with what Toffler was writing about war and anti-war, uh, mm -hmm. information became a weapon. Uh, information warfare uh, and the, po the political life in both civil and military aspects are so sensitive mm -hmm. to the changes mm -hmm. on Twitter mm -hmm. and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is um, less of the military fighting with their military, yep. but yep. more of the politicians yep. fighting yep. for the system and making decisions yep. in the, in the yep. decision-making windows yep. for the opportunity. Yep. And not only that, and, th and that reminds more of the uh, control of escalation ladder process and having a, you know, say for a say, so to speak, to control the steps, especially against the peer competitor or the great power. Uh, so how would you, how would you answer this issue in terms of transformation of thinking and the organization mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. combining I'm, both I'm, the political life and military to control yeah. the escalation ladder uh, steps? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, Jacek, that, that you touch upon this issue because uh, what we have been discussing before in terms of, in terms of defense innovation, of course, was, was limited you know, by the fact that we were only looking at defense as a, as a subsystem. But the question you're raising now, of course, looks at the, at the broader interplay of defense, economics, and, and technology. So in, in all honesty, I mean, yes, this information has become a huge topic and, and um, trying to find out who really wants to get which message across by using what kind of digital channels. Yes, it is an important subject. But in the end, I would say the even bigger challenge is if, if we say that we are on, on the cusp of, of trans, 
transiting from a traditional geostrategic environment where the traditional notion also of hard and soft power and traditional in this regard really means more or less defense, foreign and security policy. And we are transiting into a geoeconomic environment, then everything related to economics becomes much more important. So the the question I would I would have for you and also for for your audience and and the Polish decision makers is the idea of national preparedness is quite well established when we talk about um, homeland security, defense, the role of the Ministry of the Interior, border guards, and all these kind of questions. But again, national preparedness in a geostrategic world might be different than national preparedness in a geoeconomic world. So the question is, what about the Ministry of Economics? What about the Ministry of Finance? What about the ministries that are in charge of um, supporting technology development and infrastructure development? Do they have the respective analytical capacities and capabilities to understand the impact of we're going from a geostrategic world into a geoeconomic world? Now, it's not only, let's say, it's not only a question of are we properly screening foreign investors that want to engage in our national critical infrastructure? And do we have a threshold um, at which the government steps in and says, OK, now we're going to screen this investment because there might be obvious national security concerns? I mean, that's a that's a very that's a very um uh, case-driven discussion, which of course is important. Don't get me wrong. Right? There's, there's, there, there are ample reasons why you should screen foreign direct investment. But again, it's the broader picture. Do we understand where we are vulnerable from an economic perspective? Do we have a clear understanding of the dependence along our supply chains? Uh, do we know with what kind of dependence we are willing to accept and what kind of dependence we don't want to accept for societal reasons, political reasons, economic reasons, because in the end, we, we can't roll back you know, the economic model to 100% self-sufficiency. That's totally impossible. But the question then is, if you have to live with dependence, what dependence is most palatable against the background of, of Poland's uh, long-term strategic ambition? So I think going back to your, to your disinformation um, question, no? yes, that's, that's a question that, that needs to be addressed. It also needs to be addressed in terms of educating people in how to deal with this information in um, social media and, and other digital platforms. But I would say, again, the even broader question, because the disinformation part is a question that, that already has, has caught a lot of political attention. You know, there are the different, the different centers of excellence on NATO's side and inside the European Union with a hybrid center in, in, in Helsinki dealing with that. Uh, we have Sitzen in, in Brussels looking into this very specific issue. There are all sorts of initiative, um, initiatives to address this issue. If you would consider this issue as a topic um, to define a, a long-term, also policy-relevant, unique selling proposition for Poland, I would most likely say, well, don't invest your political capital where everybody else has been before, because then you're just me too. Or you would just launch the 20th initiative on fighting this information. And the question then always is, what's the added value of such an initiative um, from a foreign security policy perspective? But I could imagine that by, by um, 
shifting the focus into economic security and the question of how we organize our national systems, public sector, private sector, in order to deal with a completely new geoeconomic environment, this is an area that is not yet attracting significant attention. And I think by, by trying to come up with, with concepts and also looking perhaps into ways of how Poland's state apparatus and the Polish industry can cooperate, the famous public-private partnership that you're going to need in order to address geoeconomic challenges, this, from my perspective, would be a subject um, worth looking into because this is where the big challenges are and then we, where we are lacking adequate uh, responses from, from my perspective. Uh, how would you comment the, the following proposition uh, that would touch on your strategic flow concept and you know the, the, the rise of Eurasia and all this that you were writing about? And also let's marry it with this mili military innovation for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if because, because I find your observation about the importance of strategic flows a fundamental observation of the world geopolitics, I mean, the, the backbone of geopolitics. And because they are even more intense than ever in the history of the mankind, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the digital flows, pipelines, movement of people, but also power projection, you know, air, mm -hmm. air domain, sea domain, even now uh, electronic warfare domain, electromagnetic space domains, celestial mm -hmm. lines of communication. So if we take a look from this geostrategic perspective uh, of the decision maker on, for example, country mm -hmm. like Poland, you see a mm -hmm. mixture of all those mm -hmm. lines of communication flows moving mm -hmm. in, and especially mm -hmm. if you're landlo mm -hmm. landlocked, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So isn't it so that the military power or the power is the mechanism of imposing frictions and flows on the strategic flows, and sometimes in the escalation ladder of the conflict, Especially if, the, if Eurasia becomes mm -hmm. a single mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. it will be all about frictions and flows in the military, is to help impose friction on flows. So it's all about long rates and frictions, and about electronic and cyber, about mobility and quick reaction, uh, full readiness, right? So it's really legacy is passed behind because you, you can't recruit yeah. forces, train them. You need to react in this modern, fast world like in three minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that completely changes the models of operandi yeah. of the armed yeah. forces yeah. that are combined with the system of immunity. And it's perfectly uh, embedded in the strategic flows concept because the state is all about servicing strategic flows for the sake of community, for the sake of prosperity, for the sake yeah. of security, right? Yeah. What, what do you think about yeah. this, uh, this uh, uh, audacious or you know, brave concept of uh, operations? And, and uh, we are moving towards the, the, the future of the world, so to speak, right? In terms of the strategic flows, Eurasia, China, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a very, it's, a very interesting, it's a very interesting idea. And um, perhaps I go back again to this, to this idea of geostrategy versus geoeconomics. Of course, this is just, it's a, it's a very rough simplification as we know, right? because there is not a geostrategic world and a geoeconomic world. But just for the, sake of, for the sake of trying to reduce it, where's the center of gravity? In a geostrategic environment, it's the military force plays a bigger role as part of the center of gravity than on the geoeconomic side. Because interesting what you said with regard to friction and flows. I mean, what was the most disruptive policy decision over the last five years when it comes to causing friction in flows? The use of armed forces? No. The use of sanctions? Yes. Yeah. Huh? So here we are in, a, in, a, in an environment where, with, with a fingertip, huh? you simply say, well... I, I go, but pardon me, if you yeah. our listeners to understand. But you know, in order to impose sanctions, 
you know, we talk US, you need to have the military power behind you to enforce it. You need to control the world ocean and the SWIFT system. And so, you know, the, the domains, you need to control the domain militarily, right? To do. Uh, uh, well, I'd say I, I, would, I would agree on, you need to be able to control the relevant domains or at least to project power into the relevant domains. But I'm not sure whether, I mean, this is now, this is now hypothetical, no? But I'm still not sure to what extent the credibility of economic sanctions depend on the military enforcement potential. So that in the end, I think, is the, is the really interesting discussion. Because you could argue you could argue if this thesis would be true, economic sanctions levied by the European Commission would be most likely irrelevant because the European Commission cannot put hard power um, to back up economic sanctions. I mean, this is, this is most likely completely wrong because economic sanctions also from the European Commission and from the European nations, they, they do tend to work but again, I mean, we're coming back to this to this very interesting discussion about what is the proper role of defense forces in a world in which strategic thinking is primarily driven by economic and financial and technological arguments. I mean, this this of course doesn't this doesn't. Um, this doesn't imply that armed forces will be irrelevant, for sure not. But it changes the role of different, I think we need to, we need to, we need to unpack the black box armed forces. Because if we start looking into various defense capabilities, it becomes quite obvious that in a world that strives on flow control, certain military capabilities are absolutely essential. Space-based reconnaissance. Well, space-based reconnaissance will be key in trying to monitor no? relevant transport corridors and also trying to monitor um, the, the movement of, of, of ships and, and other transportation. Everything that the military does in the cybersecurity domain plays an absolutely essential role in a geoeconomic world, but footnote, the constitutional framework then matters a lot right? because it really depends whether you have a constitution that allows the easy domestic deployment of military assets and also a cyber force is a military asset, or if you have a constitutional framework that has erected borders between what is domestic and what is a foreign security challenge, it might be, it might be much more difficult to take, much more difficult to take recourse um, to, this, to this specific cyber capability in the civilian and, and commercial environment. And if we probably go down, go down further, the line of, of different capabilities, everything that we look into right now when it comes to um, the use of unmanned systems, for sure, that's, that's dual use, can be used in a, in a military environment and in a geoeconomic environment as well. But, but nonetheless, I would argue that the really hard work, the really hard work comes um, in terms of how you position your armed forces for this new geoeconomic environment. I see, I see one risk. Um, I've, not yet, I've not yet fully thought through this risk, but I, I could imagine that a very comfortable default position is that decision makers will say, well, you know, even in a geoeconomic world, we're going to have crisis. We need to ensure national preparedness. So there is no better um, defender of last resort 
to improve national resilience and ensure national resilience than the armed forces. Well, you can always call in the armed forces. But my, my, my fear is that this would, this would limit the role of the armed forces towards pure homeland security slash homeland defense tasks. And you would most likely start to lose everything that is needed. And then we go back to the strategic flow idea to project military power. No, always, always assuming that, that a country like Poland um, would like to project power, this option of simply reducing armed forces to the, to the savior of, of, of the last mile um, doesn't work. And also it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all in, a, in an environment where flows are um, becoming a key strategic currency. But again, let's, let's go back to your, uh, I really like the idea of frictions and flows. I mean, the, the real challenge is, and perhaps this is, this is important also for, for, for um, your audience and your decision makers to look into um, flows and frictions from a vulnerability perspective and try to come up with a national vulnerability assessment that really looks across all policy domains and tries to understand where do we, as a Polish society, as a Polish national economy, as a Polish political system, where do we depend on flows? And if these flows are disrupted, what kind of political, societal, economic friction could be caused? So it's the kind of, you know, it's, it, in a way, it's, it's funny. You know, it's the kind of oper operational net assessment that we always do with regard to a third country. What's the weakness of country X, Y, Z? But we, but we, but we hardly ever do it in terms of our own self-assessment. And this, I think, is something that is extremely important also given um, the other area that you were touching upon before, and that's this, this gray zone of, of hybrid activities where we, where we need to deal with vulnerabilities and quite honestly, uh, where we don't even know when we have become the object of a hybrid activity because it's, it's hybrid and it's, and it's like an advanced persistent threat. No? You never really know whether you are already the object of a hybrid campaign that is driven towards your country via economic means, informational means, or, or security or um, defense vectors. So I think that's, that's perhaps the last part of the answer has been a bit unstructured because I'm just thinking about these issues as well. But nonetheless, I'd say, yes, there still is a role for the armed forces in a geoeconomic world, but again, the big challenge um, lies somewhere else and goes back to the question of how well do we understand what national economic preparedness really entails in this new strategic environment. Okay, so finally, let's, let's navigate towards the, um, uh, the very simple questions that I, I'm going to have for you, Heiko. That's always uh, the most challenging, the simple Yeah, question. it's going to be, <laughs> you know, uh, ruthlessly simple, and probably the, <laughs> the answer will be critically uh, difficult. You are in Switzerland now when you talk to me. I yep. am in Warsaw. It seems yep. to be on one continent, not far away, given the, the, you know, mundane distances. But still, Europe is a very funny place, you know, there with so many nations, countries, and so on. What, what do you think, given what is going on right now in the world, with strategic flows, disruptions, mm. rise of China, mm. the, new, the, the revisionism of Russia and Europe, with all its industrial potential that is sort of legacy, with all those demo demographic, with all that the Europe is not an island, strategic mm. flows, mm. knock on the doors everywhere. Mm. Mm. And the United mm. States also has been a European power and might not have appetite for that or might change the idea how much. Yep. What do you think? Where, what will happen to Europe, Heiko? 
what decisions will be made, how, on what foundations those decisions will be made in Berlin and Brussels and in Paris. In Paris. And what is your guess even, okay? Let, maybe let's speculate. I don't need from you the sort of reasonable, mm. you know, I mean, mm. scientifically proven the concept. Mm. Uh, more of your intuition based on your mm. thorough knowledge. What mm. will happen to Europe in the ne within the next 30 years? So I will have I will have retired by then, <laughs> enjoying enjoying my my um, my time in in then my mid 80s. So this is most likely going to be a a completely different environment then. But let me perhaps try to answer your question with with one concern that I have because this might this might perhaps be um, easier to to approach this hodgepodge of, of issues that is now that is now on the table and and my biggest concern right now is and this ties back to of course um, the geoeconomic discussion and the strategic flow discussion my my biggest concern is that we are in a in a rapid process of voluntary self deindustrialization. Um, and I say this with all due respect to everybody that engages in trying to balance economic and ecological goals. No, this is not about playing one set of values and goals against the other one. But I, I, I think that, that right now we come up, and this is also driven by, by um, various, of course, um, economic and political interests also at the European level. We are right now entering a situation where we redefine the political framework for business operations in a way that, that could make Europe a no-go area for certain types of industry. If you're, if you're a resource-intensive industry, the clear signal that you currently get in Europe is with all due respect, stay away. We don't want you because of your emissions. We don't want you because you might be burning oil and gas, and this might be detrimental to, to the overall climate. Again, I'm not ridiculing this. This, of course, is a big issue. But the way we are, we are pushing this, this value set now into discussions like ESG, environmental societal government standards that are driving investment decisions, the way we want companies to create full transparency along supply chains in order to make sure that they, that they comply with all sorts of legitimate but challenging political goals are such as climate change, ensuring minority rights, um, making sure there's no slavery um, um, in, in, entailed in, your, in, in the way you, uh, you hire workforce. These are all legitimate goals, but most of these goals are political. And right now, I think we are in a way, um, putting the implementation of these goals onto the corporate sectors. And the current discussion about um, supply chain due diligence requirements with the idea of introducing mandatory due diligence requirements in, in Europe for European countries, not only in Europe, but also abroad, um, Yes, of course you can do that. Sure, you can do that, but you put the corporate sector in a very challenging um, situation, which interestingly occurs 
in tandem with the geoeconomic changes we have just discussed. No? And if you have a corporate supply chain that starts in Europe and ends in China, of course, both sides will say, um, dear managers, of course, we expect you to comply with both regulatory regimes. No? And this is, this is going to create um, either a complete bifurcation of corporate business models, because companies end up saying, okay, we need a business model for China, and we might need a business model for Asia Pacific, and we might need a business model for Europe and the transatlantic community, or we force them to retreat from certain markets because we, as, as a Western community, we are not willing to accept companies that operate under authoritarian regimes. So the whole discussion about Chile economics, and, and um, I'm just trying to put these thoughts down in a, in a paper that, that will be published soon, hopefully. Um, so we're doing all of that exactly at this very difficult point in time where Western nations no longer are the sole force no, in shaping the geoeconomic environment, but rather new forces, new emerging nations. And it's not only a thing of us democracies versus them um, authoritarian regimes. No, we have seen many democratic nations on a, on a slippery slope down towards um, authoritarian policymaking inside the European Union, outside the European Union. So I think the democracy versus authoritarianism dichotomy, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's useful. It's, it's a narrative that I consider increasingly toxic. But, but, but in the end, the question is, we are, we are requiring companies in a way, and this, of course, again, is simplified. Huh? We are requiring these days, we in Europe, we are requiring companies to solve political problems that not even our governments were able to solve. And at the same time, we do not only require companies to solve these problems, we, only, we also, on, the, on top of that, we also introduce compliance requirements. No? So it's a, it's, a, it's a dual challenge that we, that we um, ask companies to deal with. And we are doing this against the background of the long-term fallout of a significant pandemic. No? So in a, in a way, I'm not sure, and even if we put now 700, 800, 900 billions of euros, or even, even a trillion of euros um, to enable um, European recovery, I'm not sure whether this is the right moment to come up with a very demanding values-driven normative framework as the future operating model um, of the corporate sector in Europe. And that's why I think we are really, we are really risking to lose uh, significant portions of our Yes, you could call it the old economy, but the old economy is where also traditional geoeconomic power is at home. Well, it's with the heavy industries, it's with the mining industries, it's with oil and gas, it's, it's in a way also with transportation and logistics. And now we're moving over into, into a new economic world where we think that by digitizing everything, we free ourselves uh, from the fact that Still, a digital business model depends on the provision of resources and depends on the provision of infrastructure, which again will um, need to face the same age-old geostrategic challenges than the old economy. No, so that's why I think sometimes this this hype about a new economy that looks into 
into the digitization of everything um, against the background of what we were just discussing is um, is perhaps in the long run a, a big fallacy because it might lead to a trap and then, then, I'll, then I'll end with that. It might lead to a trap that is already in the making if you have been following news about um, the, the Chinese um, Cybersecurity Administration and their most recent new regulations on how to share data inside the country and across the country, China is already on the way to become a huge data silo that no longer strives on its operability, but rather concentrates also given its dual circle economy approach right now that really focuses on also keeping data inside the country. No? But most Western companies these days have engaged on the Chinese market. Um, so this decision that you might no longer be able to bring data out of China could become something like a very big digital honeypot. Now it has been extremely attractive. Everybody was flying into the honeypot and all of a sudden you change the rules and it's, and it's game over. Or at least it's not game over, but it's game over for the traditional business model that was depending on, again, the free flow of data. And this traditional digital business model might now need to be redesigned for a world in which data will no longer travel freely because you have different regulatory regimes. And in a way, this is not only a China issue. I mean, as you and your audience, of course, is perfectly aware from, from uh, following the news, that's an issue with the European Union. And of course, it's an issue with, with the US as well. No? So in the end, we might end up, and there's a nice, there's a nice book there's a nice book on this by, um, by an American scholar called Stephen Weber. It's called Block by Block. Um, I really recommend it to you and your, and your audience. So the subtitle is How to Build a Global Enterprise for the New Regional Order. No? So the question is, if we no longer, if we no longer have a unifying a global economic order, but if we rather need to prepare for different and diverging regional orders, what is then the impact on, um, on your business model? And perhaps reorganizing business models according to regional requirements might be one option. But of course, this option comes with a heavy price. Huh? And the heavy price is efficiency and effectiveness will need to be completely reinterpreted because scale, yeah, you, 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 can, you can continue to scale inside the regional order, but scaling beyond the regional order, which was only possible, and that, by the way, is, is also a nice, a nice, perhaps, think piece. Um, the unipolar moment was perhaps the most decisive factor in shaping digital business models. Because under the unipolar moment, there was only one really decisive market, one hegemon, one set of rules. And this provided the basis for a single platform scale quickly approach. If we now end up in a, in a multipolar environment where each pole uh, wants to mimic the same idea, well, the one platform fits all markets idea will most likely become a thing of the past. So, and, and I think then this, no, the consequences, the long-term also consequences for prosperity, um, it's perhaps something that we, that we need to think about um, more, more vigorously because it also means that the famous, the famous Brussels effect, you know, that Brussels is able to influence 
economically relevant regulation across the globe because it is such an attractive market might simply be coming to an end because we might get a, I don't know, we might get a Beijing effect or we might get a New Delhi effect in the future if they try to apply the same the same way of, of influencing um, business relevant regulation. Uh, very interesting and uh, the great um, great insight uh, for comments, uh, uh, so to speak, Haikov. If I may also add with, on, on my side, you were saying about scaling down or scaling up access, digital access to all the customers in the world, technically. Uh, it was not only about the, you know, the supply, the d- demand side mm-hmm. that you have mm-hmm. customers, but mm-hmm. you also have had a lot of labor, which was cheap. And you, you, yep. don't need to, you, you, you didn't need to live next to them, so to speak, right? And mm-hmm. you need to pay them the social premiums and so on. Yeah, and uh, 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 what would happen to European social construct and social deal, the social contract between governments and society, between labor and capital, mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. it would have to scale down in terms of labor without mm-hmm. having access to the Chinese market, for example, or, mm-hmm. Indian market, mm-hmm. or even to US, if mm-hmm. those, you know, if the fray is going to, to de- you know, de- deepen. Uh, the, the, you know, sometimes I think, and it would be short, you know, we're navigating towards the end of our conversation. It's been already a lot of time of yours. Um, you know, that, that, that maybe the same would happen to Europe, what happened to China in the 19th century. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question because, you know, in a, in a way it goes back to the, to the, to the Club of Rome thing, no? because perhaps the Club of Rome was the first, the first, um, The gathering of experts that try to get this scaling down message across for the first time. So what is going to happen to, um, I mean, we all have, sorry, sorry, I'm just thinking about what you said. We all have expensive business models. We all expand into something, no? Expand into new technology domains, expand into new markets expand into new countries. It's always projecting, projecting, projecting. I think what is really interesting to see now, and and this goes back also to the military innovation discussion we had at the beginning, and let me spend a second on that and then I'll then I'll go back again to, to the scaling. I just put down a note to the to the scaling question. Um, one of the most one of the most striking outcomes of strategic competition and military innovation is that strategic competitors start to look alike. They don't deviate from each other. They mimic each other and thus they resemble each other. There was a famous, very interesting paper in in the Washington Quarterly um, four or five years ago, asking the question um, why why China is not really leapfrogging over the U.S. in in many different um, defense relevant technology areas, and the thesis of the authors was um, well, even a strategic challenger like China makes a rational risk calculation, and if If an out-of-the-box innovation provides more strategic gains than strategic risks, the challenger might go with the innovation. But the tricky thing with an innovation is, this is like Forrest Gump and the box of chocolate. You never know whether whether that innovation materializes until you've tried it. So that implies that even strategic challengers are risk averse. That's why they rather copy each other than come up with something new. Now let's go back to the scaling and strategic mimicking. Um, 
the really interesting question is, will other emerging nations start to copy China's circular economy business model? Because all of a sudden, this is no longer an approach that exclusively builds on expanding, but it combines, let's say, targeted outreach to partners with the idea that you need to grow a big and important national market that can, that can sustain itself. Um, so most likely there won't be too many other nations that can embark on the same road, but at least India would be a candidate for a similar approach, or well, given the size of its market, if you, if you go for the very traditional criteria, size of market, um, labor force available, um, technology expertise in certain, in certain sectors. So I think this, this idea of coming up with, with a new model of how you generate prosperity in a non-benign international environment, China now comes with a completely different offer than the West has. Going back to strategic competitors create lookalikes, the question is, who will remain in, let's say, the transatlantic camp? And who might tilt the way because of some of the very specific um, features of the Chinese market? But nevertheless, this combination no, of advancing self-sufficiency self -sufficiency while being more cautious in what kind of being more cautious about what kind of dependencies you're willing to accept. I could also imagine that this approach becomes interesting for, let's say, more industrialized nations, not that want to reduce their vulnerability that stems from, from international dependence. So I think this is going to be a very interesting question over the next couple of years, which kind of prosperity model will be more successful in the long run? And um, perhaps also which prosperity model will be, will be more attractive for international partners? Fascinating, uh, Heiko, this is fascinating. And uh, I would like to, you know, continue on, down on this topic. And I have like several questions already, you know, <laughs> crossing my, my, my mind. Uh, Let's go for another three hours. Session. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, I, it's been longer than I promised to you. So, uh, so we need to end. Uh, I hope that the audience will understand and will even press me more for, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to you for another one. Uh, thank you very much, Heiko. That I really enjoyed really it. Great. Thank you so much, Jacek. It was a real pleasure. Uh, uh, and thank you to, to, to all the listeners and, and to watchers, uh, to all the viewers. Uh, our guest was Heiko Borschert. Uh, uh, fascinating talk and stay with us. Uh, strategy and future.